Okay, um, I think we've given people enough time. And I don't want to cut you short, Samyukta, because I'm sure you have a really interesting uh, story to tell. And we have a plenary starting at seven o'clock sharp. So let's get started. Sure. Lovely. So welcome, everyone. I am so excited to introduce Samyukta Vijayan. Uh, she is a leading role model, an artist, a techie, a public speaker, an entrepreneur. Um, she's a trans woman who works on transgender rights, increasing access to opportunities for the transgender community. She was Swiggy's first ever transgender hire and has been really at the forefront of leading the diversity and inclusion movement in the India's uh, tech industry and beyond. And on top of all of that, she runs a clothing startup, uh, Toot Studio, uh, that provides employment to other transgender people based in Bangalore. So what an inspiration. Really excited to have you. Over to you, Samyukta. Um, thank you so much. I'm excited to be part of this um, webinar. Um, so the, the topic today that I thought um, we would, you know, discuss um, is how to access um, how to provide um, uh, access to transgender folks to, to be part of uh, the mainstream uh, workforce, right? Um, but before we get there, there are a few things that I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, so before my startup and um, now working with Swiggy, I used to work um, with Amazon um, for almost 10 years. And most of my time um, was spent uh, in Europe and the US. Um, one of the stark differences that I see um, between uh, the West and India um, is how they um, look at, um, you know, transgender people um, with respect to um, uh, not just um, social, um, uh, you know, uh, social class, um, economic um, aspects, but also with respect to um, legal, um, and uh, kind of official documentation kind of aspects, right? Um, earlier this morning, um, there was a health worker um, who contacted me and she wanted to, uh, she works in the space of trying to provide um, access to healthcare, um, especially with respect to, um, you know, uh, regular, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, healthcare requirements like you know taking your BB or taking your um, sugar or metabolic rate etc cetera, etc cetera, to a wider um, set of audience especially in this case she wanted to talk about the third gender and she told me that is the space she's working on and then as she was speaking about it I asked um, you call transgender people the third gender and uh, so who is the first gender and she was laughing about it and she said, okay, maybe men are first gender and women are second. And um, now, uh, you know, transgender people are third gender. I was trying to understand why um, uh, India and a few other countries have this um, third gender narrative about um, transgender people. Um, while there are a lot of social and economic reasons, uh, you know, why there is this kind of uh, classes behavior between men, women, um, and transgender people. Um, one of the easiest uh, things that people uh, you know, often say is like, it's just, it's just a way to um, number or name um, uh, you know, these people, right? Um, then I asked one of my friends, uh, why would transgender people be the third gender? Why can't men be the third gender and transgender people be the first gender if it was all about just giving some random name and number uh, to people, right? Um, so what I'm trying to say is, uh, there has always been this social um, uh, isolation and discrimination and uh, you know, exclusion um, that has been attributed to um, uh, people not conforming to conventional gender roles, especially transgender people. And it, the, the, the word, Strong, uh, third gender kind of add to that, um, and uh, and when I when I speak to uh, people about this, you really, really use the third gender narrative to define transgender people. Uh, one of the other things that came up was um, the Transgender uh, Protection uh, Rights Act of two thousand nineteen. Um, 
talk about um, you know all uh, uh, you know all uh, you know uh, spaces with the public or private um, uh, you know enterprises um, sh that they should not discriminate against the third gender and uh, you know um, that all their for example job applications their internal documents should have the other or third uh, gender category so um, they use third gender as a way to identify transgender people and to be able to ensure that their rights um, are, are being being provided to them. Uh, it's kind of very similar to how we talk about um, the reservation and caste system, right? Unless you put yourself as a scheduled caste or a scheduled tribe, um, people wouldn't know, so you they cannot enforce uh, the rights that you're supposed to get. Um, so this is kind of very similar. Unless you identify yourself as a third gender, um, you probably don't get accounted in that in, in, in that space to be able to uh, take in the rights and and, and the uh, and the additional uh, privileges that you probably might get, right? But uh, I personally think there are better ways to do it than calling first, second, and third gender. For example, in my passport, in my other card, um, I uh, I call myself a woman, and that is how it is, right? Um, so 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 the way people see transgender people um, need to change uh, because third gender automatically gives, uh, brings some kind of um, social, um, you know, the third class kind of a narrative, which I do not like at all. Um, so when I, so I used to, as I said, I used to work for uh, Amazon in Europe and the US in 2017, I decided to move back to Bangalore to see um, how I can work with the community here in India, right? Um, and one of the first things that we were trying to figure out is how do you bring them into mainstream jobs? And I was working with a program manager in Amazon um, who was helping me figure out um, what kind of job opportunities can we actually, uh, you know, get get these people in uh, for. Um, I work with a couple of um, uh, NGO groups uh, which were working with transgender people and then we were trying to figure out um, based on their skill set what kind of jobs can, can we provide them uh, within Amazon. Um, it, is, it is not too shocking to know that um, it is very difficult um, to provide a regular corporate job to them and then um, we, we found out only jobs like an administration assistant or um, uh, like a picker or a packer job in a warehouse um, were the jobs that we could provide uh, to them because of, of the skill set that they, that they had. Most of them were dropouts from schools or colleges um, and did not have any necessary corporate training and all that. Right. Um, so we said, OK, why don't we at least give it a try? So we said um, we will at least hire five people um, uh, for the picker and uh, packer jobs in the uh, warehouses. And I was trying to work with these um, uh, NGOs, um, trying to get uh, at least five people to take up those jobs. Those jobs would pay these people 10,000 rupees a month. And unfortunately, they had to travel all the way from Central Bangalore to Hillscote, where Amazon's warehouse was. We had zero takers for those jobs. One of the transgender person that I was speaking to, I asked her, why would you not take this job? And she told me that she earns thousand rupees per day just by begging or doing sex work, um, right? So, so what we realized was there is a skills gap. There is an expectation gap with respect to how to bring these transgender people into mainstream jobs, right? Um, and that is why that is one of the reasons I did this. I wanted to do this startup, where we thought, is it possible to bring our transgender people in, give them some kind of training, um, uh, you know, corporate training or something like that, and then get them to a job that is not, a, you know, a, a, too constraining with respect to the financial aspects, right? And we we hired four transgender women. We uh, train them in um, customer service, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, makeup, hairstyling, a lot of, you know, different, different things based on their interests. And, and we, we place at least two or three of them and one person just recently got placed. And we realized um, the, the, that one way we could actually bring in some change is to 
have a conscious bias, take people in who may or may not have a proper corporate training or proper skill set that match your corporate jobs. Um, train them for a few months with no expectation that they would, that after training they would immediately convert um, into a full-time uh, worker, but just do it um, because um, that is the only way to actually bring these people into the mainstream uh, workforce, right? And um, October last year, um, so I was working with Periphery and a couple of other uh, NGOs and uh, they, the, the NGOs and ANZ put together um, a training um, course based on inputs from people like us um, for a one month training course where they have 25 transgender people participate in the training course um, and then post that. Uh, they would help these people get jobs. So they had a job fair and multiple uh, corporates came in, um, you know, interviewed them and hired them. Um, I think more than 20 people uh, got hired as part of that uh, job fair. And we were hoping to do uh, more of those things. Um, and earlier this year, we had plans uh, in similar lines and then um, coronavirus happened and, and a lot of those things. Um, are now uh, in uh, in the back burner, right? Um, so, in these times uh, where most companies are struggling just to survive, diversity and inclusion often is not people's top priority. And even within diversity and inclusion, um, what people look for is 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 first, uh, you know, gender equality with respect to getting women um, into the mainstream jobs. Um, uh, persons with di dis disabilities, the LGBT uh, folks, and you know transgender people within that LGBT umbrella come uh, way you know down uh, uh, the scale simply because of the kind of skill sets that they do not have and the amount of time that re that's required to ramp them up to get those skills, um, right? Um, so so when I th when I think about um, the way um, uh, you know the COVID lockdown has changed our our workplaces. Um, there are some stark um, uh, you know changes uh, that we see, right? And um, so we are moving away uh, to a mostly online, remote um, you know uh, teleconferencing a way of working, and 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 that means um, two two things in in my mind. One. Um, you probably, if you, if you see the way it is, you probably have, especially within the organized sector, um, you probably have, have more opportunities um, for women uh, to come in to take a better place because um, what, we what we normally think, at least in the corporate uh, circles, that are, uh, women um, cannot do as good a job as a man, especially when they are married, have kids, and they also have to take care of uh, their households and maybe alien parents and stuff like that. And, and the word uh, commitment mostly meant that men were more available in the office, uh, in person, uh, for longer hours um, than women. But now with the, uh, with, with the, with the seismic change in, in, in the way we work, um, where uh, working from home, um, is becoming the norm uh, rather than the exception. Um, it is possible that the organized sec sector actually has more women, um, uh, more women um, joining the workforce. Um, again, that is just a possibility. We still have to see if that really, really works. And that also depends on men taking equal, um, you know, workload. Uh, in their households to be able to support these women to join the workforce. But how does that impact um, transgender people, right? Uh, which so that's where I come to my second point. Um, so one of the bigger problems that we saw putting transgender people into workspaces was, um, yes, professionally, um, we were giving them some opportunity, but within those work uh, places, um, they still faced social um, uh, isolation. Uh, for example, one of these girls would tell me that, they, that she would not be able to 
go to lunch with uh, with some of uh, the co-workers simply because it was very difficult for her to mingle uh, within the group though she was working in a corporate job um right um some of those problems um may be overcome with people working from home where um the 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 imbalance with respect to um uh, transgender people uh, getting themselves uh, you know assimilated into the social um uh, setup uh, is no longer a requirement because everybody is like socially isolated anyways right um and um, there is much bigger opportunity to provide um skills based training uh, for these transgender people because they need that the most uh, now online training and, and stuff becoming uh, you know much more um, accepted and available and the tech for that is also uh, much more uh, you know widely available um the the skills training and and kind of things can 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 get accelerated but the bigger problem um that i see is um as i said most corporates are in survival mode by the end of this year when the lockdown eases when things probably come back to 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 to, to normal um i don't know if the priority of uh, these corporates uh, would be to to hire the most qualified the most um easily available uh, person or they would still um you know uh, give a focus on diversity and inclusion and you know train these tons of people um you know have the patience for them to ramp up and then take them into the into the mainstream workforce that is that is still to be seen um and 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 we are we are figuring out how can we make make these things fast for example in this lockdown period is there any way we could figure out um you know uh, you know training uh, these folks um you know so that by the time the lockdown eases uh, you know um and the transgender folks are ready uh, to take up a, a reasonable corporate job um but, but those things are still st- to be seen and and i'm hoping that i can be part of at least some of that that work that is going on um i think i've rambled on about enough um so if there are any questions that you guys want to ask me or there is anything Uh, that we could discuss and happen to to that. Great, thanks so much for that, Samyukta. Um, for those of you who are listening in, please do use the Q&A chat box, uh, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I will be happy to pass along any questions you may have uh, for Samyukta. So we'll just give um, folks a minute or two in case they have any questions. Great, so while we wait for some questions to trickle in um, from Ankita Chandwani. How do you think we can increase transgender inclusion in the corporate world? You, know, you already spoke a, a lot about the different efforts you're engaged in to bridge the skills and expectations gap, um, but any, any concrete asks for firms, you know, when there are costs perhaps associated, right? On private companies, how do you make that easier? yeah um so in 2014 um the nasa judgment um which was a landmark judgment for transgender people um said something like this um and the the, the court thing um, is, is two points one any person has the freedom to identify themselves as what they want male female third gender whatever you cannot force a transgender people to a person to always be the third gender right um the second one is um governments and possibly private corporate spaces need to have some kind of um you know reservation for transgender people um to be recruited into mainstream jobs um even the government and public spaces have not implemented uh, either of these to be honest but the second one um, specifically that they do not have any way uh, for um, for some kind of reservation um, for uh, transgender folks to be part of the mainstream jobs 
Um, given that kind of an official setup is not available even in the public space, I cannot expect the same thing from the uh, private space and corporates. However, it is possible um, for people like us to have a conscious bias um, to, 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 to understand um, that, uh, you know, the, the, the transgender uh, population have not had any um, economic um, value addition, not because um, they cannot, uh, just because they haven't been allowed to uh, do so, right? Um, when you think uh, in, in those lines, then you have this conscious bias um, to create roles, to, to, to provide maybe part-time opportunities, maybe remote uh, opportunities, consciously um, to people from the transgender community, um, um, understanding that you will have to incur at least you know, some cost in providing uh, then the right uh, set of skills and training. Um, and you have the patience to, to, to wait for them to ramp up and then you, you, you take them in, right? So we thought, because if you think about it, the transgender community has been one of the, um, uh, you know, uh, at the receiving end um, of the COVID uh, lockdown with a lot of people who used to, um, you know, uh, have, uh, you know, earn their daily, um, uh, you know, food by way of begging or sex work, um, no, no longer have those opportunities and, and they are severely affected, right? So, so yes, we need to have that conscious bias to say, okay, I know I can hire, um, a, you know, a, a regular uh, person for this job, but I'm going to consciously figure out if there is a way I could get in a transgender person, even if it means we have to wait a few more months to, for them to have the skills training and uh, you know, ramp up and then um, get into jobs. Great, that was super helpful. Um, we have a question from Kanishka around, um, of course, there are you know private sector uh, policies and practices, but from the government, what might be some dream policy changes you'd like to see to create better incentives and opportunities uh, for transgender pe people? Yeah, uh, the first thing, as I've been saying, please get away with this whole third gender narrative. I consciously remember that when the Transgender Protection Rights Bill was discussed in the parliament, um, there was a, pol a politician, a, a woman politician, talking about um, it, you know, transgender people in this way. She was like saying um, the men, uh, the women, and the others, and she was rolling her eyes as if she was talking about a bunch of uh, people in the extremely low so social class, and she was absolutely disgusted to, to be even talking about them. Um, what we see are um, our politicians are particularly extremely insensitive um, about uh, the, the legal uh, terminology or the, or, or the rights that the Supreme Court provides the transgender people um, and, 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 the, and the transgender protections uh, and, and rights bill does not talk about reservation at all. And I think these are the two big things that I would, I, I would love for the government um, to have, uh, you know, a, a, uh, people from the community, educated people from the community to be part of the policy making um, efforts and consciously uh, work towards, uh, you know, incorporating these pages. Fantastic. Um, just in the interest of time, I'll ask a last question for a quick response. Um, it is a, is, is a quite uh, <laughs> complex question, but I'd love to hear what you think. Um, so in your experience, what are some effective ways to instill higher levels of sensitization in the general public, perhaps either through the media or uh, through an inclusivity curriculum in schools? How do you change norms? Yeah, absolutely. You need to start these things from the lower level, um, like schools and colleges, um, and and one and, and then even even uh, you know people uh, like us when we talk about um, our children, 
specifically your children, um, um, about how um, gender um, is a social construct. And, and we don't have to um, put too much importance into how um, you know, uh, people behave. Um, like, uh, like you know, when I was uh, a school going child, um, I was bullied for being for having a very feminine demeanor, um, and in and 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 things like that. A lot of such things have still not changed, especially in the in the semi-urban and and rural uh, areas, right? Um, so unless those things change, it is not possible to achieve a like proper social inclusion. Um, and unless we achieve uh, social inclusion uh, in that way. Um, it is going to be very, very difficult for transgender people to break into um, being providers of any kind of economic value. Um, but these things are, as I said, uh, in, 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 in your mind, um, in the way you look at people, in the way you behave, with, you, you, you talk to people. Um, one of the things that I keep telling people um, is um, maybe um, you do not have to um, accommodate or even accept me, but I still demand that you treat me with dignity and respect. Thank you so much, Samyukta. That was really inspiring. Um, and I really hope that uh, everyone's able to invest just as much in diversity and inclusion as we come back from COVID, and that one day our society can really move away from viewing and tagging transgender people as the third gender and are able to embrace all genders really as, as equal.